Welcome to Stranger Things in the 1980s. My name is Vince Locke. I am your host. In this podcast, my guest and I take deep dives into the Upside Down, where we analyze each episode of the Netflix series, along with related movies and books, and examine them in the context of 1980s America. In this episode, Glenn Birdsall returns to help me talk about camcorders and chapter three, the polywog. Hey everyone, Vince here. Before we get into this episode, I just wanna say that any financial support you can throw our way would be greatly appreciated. Because this podcast is based on a college course and its primary purpose is to be educational, I don't want to commercialize it. I feel strongly that knowledge and education should not be commercialized. However, I am more than happy to accept donations. Now, we're still going to make the podcast because we enjoy doing it, and we're always going to do it for free, so don't worry about that. But if you want to support us, you can click on the link in the show notes, and we'll give you a shout-out in an upcoming episode. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Stranger Things of the 1980s. I'm joined again today by friend and fellow stranger, Glenn Birdsall. Glenn, do you want to remind our listeners who you are? Yes, I am a carbon-based life form. Is that right, Vince? <laughs> I think that's true. Is that how you humans say that? Is it <laughs> kind of like that? We don't usually specify it so so uh, explicitly like that, but... All sure. right, well... I'm trying to be as close to a human being as possible. Okay. So I, I'm carbon based. I'm also based in Flint, Michigan. Okay. So there's another, there's base number two. Right now I'm at work and I'm doing this from work, which I work at a big tall building downtown. <laughs> so I'm overlooking downtown Flint. I am what's known as an information scientist, which is kind of like a librarian smooshed with a psychology degree too. Oh, that's other cool. stuff. Yeah. So that's what I do for a living. But I do a lot of art shows too. Awesome. What do, you, what, do you need my social security number as well? Not publicly. You might want okay. to send that to me on the down low. And it's five, how's five, your, your five, credit history? Six, eight, seven, <laughs> and then a bunch of other digits. Okay. <laughs> how are you doing? Not too bad. So today, our special topic is camcorders. What do you know about camcorders? What do I know about camcorders? Yeah. Well, you know, they were uh, the very inexpensive sort of camera they could get back in the 80s. They were a lot of fun. I mean, I remember making my first movie with them. So, yeah, I was going to ask you if you had one back in the day because I didn't. My family didn't. I got one from my community college at one point. Okay. Uh, I could borrow them. Oh. Uh, and I had a film class there. So that's nice. how I did it. Yeah. You know, a lot of people either don't realize or don't remember that, you know, back in the 80s, this is really new technology, you know, camcorders and VCRs and that sort of stuff. Often what people would do is they would go to like a video store because we had those back in the day Yes, and you could rent a VCR or a camera or something like that for a weekend. And so for a lot of people, or even a game console, for a lot of people, that's how we experienced, you know, watching movies at home or playing games at home is we could just go and rent this stuff. Yeah. And Flint, the, um, Curtis Mathis had a giant store and could rent all that kind of stuff there. Yeah. So yeah, camcorders, I mean, what are camcorders? Part of it, you know, it, it's there in the name, camcorder, it's <laughs> a camera, but it's not just a camera. I mean, you could play back inside it, I suppose. 
because right. they recorded, right? Yeah. So that's the other part of the name camcorder. It's a camera that records. And prior to that, you know, video cameras, first of all, video cameras were generally speaking really big. And so they had to be used in like a TV studio and they weren't really portable. You know, you used to be able to get some like real to real video cameras, like a Super 8 camera that was more portable. That was right. popular in the 1970s, especially. The first really portable what came to be known as camcorders were like two separate units. You had the camera, which was connected to a recorder by a cable. But then in 1983, Sony introduced the first sort of all-in-one camcorder, uh, a camera that recorded into the camera itself. And it used Betamax technology. Yeah, You remember Betamax? Yeah, weird-shaped tapes. Weird in the sense that they were small for one thing but also they only had like one reel on them it seemed like whereas yeah. like vhs had two reels so yeah kind of strange technology sony which developed the technology went all in on supporting it and so we ended up getting the the videotape wars of the early 80s between vhs and and betamax sony ended up losing because jvc made the vhs the uh, video home system cassettes, which were bigger, but you know, ultimately cheaper to make and therefore more widely available. And so they won the the uh, video recording wars in the day. I think they also won by way of, I think Sony refused to share like the patents and yes. technology. Yes. And since no, all these other smaller companies wanted to get in on it, and VHS was like, oh, here's how we do everything. They kind yes. of made it so like the public sort of voted out Betamax by way of having universally accepted yeah. format for the whole, you know, planet, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, beta was very much proprietary technology. And something similar played out not too long ago with the HD DVD format versus Blu-ray. Sony was behind the Blu-ray technology, and they ended up winning that battle. But right. yeah, Beta back in the day, expensive, hard to find, and hard to use, relatively hard to use, compared yeah. to the, the VHS technology. So yeah, it was in uh, 1983 that Sony introduced the first camcorder, as we would recognize one today, uh, the, the all-in-one video camera recorder. And then JVC introduced their own version later on that year but it was in 1984 in the spring of 84 that they introduced uh another version that used vhsc which is the very camera that we see being used in stranger things right so that's what the camcorders were why were this so important because you said that you know you had access to one what did you use it for I mean, I used it for, you know, making movies, really. Made a couple short, tiny little scary movies. You know, that's basically what we did. You know, a lot of people use it for, like, everyday things. Right. And when you think of, like, the show Jackass, I mean, <laughs> that was pre-Jackass. We were doing those kind of things. Like, oh, I'm going to film my uh, neighbor jumping a bunch of Tonka trucks on his mini right. bike. Camcorders made it so easy to create personal video content like that, or even right. to make your own movies or music videos. Now, like I said, I never had a camcorder in the day. I always wanted one because I wanted to make music videos. I thought that would be so cool. Gotcha. Yep. But that was the advantage of the camcorder is you didn't need a TV studio or movie studio set up to go out and create content, video content. You could do it using this portable device, which was revolutionary for the time. Oh, yeah, definitely. And relatively inexpensive. Although, looking at the example of the JVC uh, that we see in Stranger Things, which, by the way, is the same model that was used in Back to the Future that Marty McFly uses to document the time machine, the time travel stuff. 
Okay. Which I'm sure that's a very deliberate choice on the producers of Stranger Things to use that particular model. But when that came out, that was, and I looked this up, how expensive it was, $1,595. That was the MSRP, which is the equivalent of $4,645 in 2022 dollars. So fairly expensive, although as with most technology, the price does drop considerably fairly quickly right right back in um 87 i remember a friend having i think it was fisher price put out something i think it was like called the pxl yes i mean that was so simple that kids could use it absolutely and it was specifically marketed to kids and i thought that was pretty cool too so and it's it made this technology and the ability, like I said, to produce video content, it gave it to the masses in a way that had never been done before. So what are the lasting effects, do you think, of camcorders? What's the legacy of the camcorder? When you think about it, what's fun about this idea is that the Andy Warhol quote, we're all going to be famous for 15 minutes. Uh Uh-huh. And now everybody's loading up to YouTube or TikTok. And these are are all like, you know, the Darwinian evolution (laughs) of everybody being able to create their own content. I mean, think about the idea that there wasn't a time when everybody could afford, and I know this sounds bizarre nowadays, but not everybody could afford pens and paper at one point. Nobody could learn how to knew how to read and write. Uh, exactly. So there's a point where like mediums, uh, medians, mediums. Yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Media. Media. Plus, uh, people are creating their own paintings. They're yes. Able to, you know, one of the great ones is uh, 3D sculpting with plastic now. Right. Right. So that's an example of like technology making things easier for us. And not um, just easier, but increasing access. Yeah. And you'd make a good point about how, you know, going back to the Andy Warhol idea about fame, one of the results of having camcorders is you got TV shows like America's Funniest Home Videos, which gave people a chance to become famous or at least win some money from producing video content on their portable you know, camera recorders. And that has led to, as you say, YouTube and TikTok and all of these online venues now. I mean, and camcorders really, I mean, technically they still exist, but they're much more specialized now. Uh, How have they evolved? What do we use instead? Well, you know, I I remember when cameras got so good you know, not only on phones, but yes, just the regular inexpensive cameras got so good. I remember when Spike Lee was making um, Bamboozled. Yeah. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Best Buy and buy a camera that anybody can buy and make mm-hmm. this movie. And I'm telling you, that movie looked amazing. It was edited so well. Right. It was a great movie. And he made it on a Best Buy camera. Yeah. That anybody could purchase. Yeah. And, and part of the, the development there is you're not recording to film anymore. It's not videotape. It's all digital now, which is much cheaper and much easier to edit and manipulate. And so, yeah, there was that evolution into digital cameras, which evolved into the cameras which everyone has on their phones now. You know, everyone carries essentially a camcorder in their pocket now in their cell phone. Yeah, yeah. So what's the connection between camcorders and what we're talking about today, Stranger Things, specifically Chapter 3, The Polywog? What's the connection there? How does it play into the show? I mean, if we want to get, you know, meta on it, you know, the the show itself, the people that are creating this, the, uh-huh. the brothers, they clearly were in love with this technology because yes you know they fit into the idea of you know the spielbergs and everybody else that grew up with this sort of thing and you know this is how they probably started thinking about right. what they're making that's a more good directly 
more directly, you know, you have the camcorder as a character in this. Yeah. It was literally a character telling other characters what had happened. Exactly. You know, like I said earlier, the JVC camcorder that we see in the show, and in particular in this episode, is the same model that was used in Back to the Future. So, yeah, camcorders very directly are a part of the show and this episode. Yeah, yeah, just trying to plug that weird turkey in with all of the cords that we used to have. <laughs> yes. That's your cable. What's that thing? Trying to figure out how to play the tape, put the tape into the VCR, and how come that doesn't work. Well, it's not the same right. format, but... And then you're calling Radio Shack, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you can call Radio Shack for this. So, a couple of things, uh, points I want to make about that. Yeah, so Radio Shack, which isn't around anymore, unfortunately. Well, or at least I think it's unfortunate because I used to go to Radio Shack all the time to get some blank audio cassettes for making mixtapes and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, there's no need to do that anymore, but that's, I love going to, to Radio Shack and checking out all the technology and, and the gadgets they have there. So that's, that I'm kind of sad about the demise of Radio Shack. The other point I want to make though, is that this says something about Bob and Bob's character, because he is a manager there at Radio Shack. Right, right. I mean, it's it's pretty neat that, you know, he's working there and yeah, not sure where you're going with that one. Well, I mean, think about going back to the idea of how expensive those cameras were. So that model, like I said, was introduced in spring of 1984, which is the same year that this particular season is set. So he, by virtue of mm -hmm. working at Radio Shack, was able to get access to this technology very quickly, probably before most of the rest of the public. And he probably paid full price for it. So $1,600 for this camera. That tells you something about, you know, his job and either how good he is at saving money or how well paid he was. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, good point. I mean, I'm sure there's an employee discount to some degree for sure. Uh, Radio Shack Goids. What, who? <laughs> the employees of Radio Shackers. Shack. Radio right. Shackers. The Shackers. <laughs> yeah, probably there was. But still, that that's still would have been, a, a, even if it were 10, 15% off, that's still, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of money. And with that, I mean, when you're thinking about the story, it's, it is a, a neat turn with him because, one, he's helping her with that. He helps her find her keys. Mm-hmm. Um, he, <laughs> that, that's a good point because that's a callback to the first episode when she right. lost her keys. And, you know, the, and then, you know, he's driving Will to school and literally he's, he, in this episode, he becomes such a supporter. Yes. Literally has turned into Samwise. <laughs> in the blink of our eye. Right. He's now, you know, part of the group sort of helping. Uh -huh. He's not up front like he needs, like, you know, like a Frodo. He's not yes. out there like doing any of the heavy lifting, but he's there like Samwise. Yes. The guy you can depend on. Absolutely. Hook up your VCR. <laughs> you know, Samwise is always good at hooking up the Hobbit's VCRs. Yes, I, I I'm sure he absolutely was. So yeah, but he really is, and I think that's a, an important point. He is such a good guy, especially for Joyce. When you look at, you know, Joyce's former husband. Comparing the two of them, quite a, a big difference there. Quite and looking difference. at the the sort of economic backgrounds that we've talked about before, you know, Joyce and the Byers family is very much that working class you know, background in relation to the rest of the characters. And so, I mean, know, Bob, I, I feel like he's also somewhat working class, even though it's a good job mm -hmm. and he can afford the camera. Right. He's still bringing bologna sandwiches. <laughs> that is true. So it's not like he's bringing her lobster every day. <laughs> right. So, yeah, he does have that sort of working class uh, sort of mentality, I think. But he is able or in theory would be able to help them sort of move up in the world. Absolutely. And seems to be willing to do it. You know, like I said, he is a good guy. Yeah. So, I mean, you need those kind of people around, you know, the ones that that do for others without asking for anything in return. It's super important. 
So a bit of a spoiler, you know, what happens to Bob later on in the season, you know, he ends up dying. And just as so many people were upset about the death of Barb in the first season, there was the hashtag justice for Barb circulating online. What about justice for Bob? I mean, come on. People just forget all about Bob. What about Bob? What about Bob? <laughs> That's right. For the people that haven't gotten that far yet, oops. But anyways. <laughs> you know, like I've said before, spoiler warnings. You know, you can expect that we're going to be talking about the show as a whole, or at least the seasons as a whole going on. So right, absolutely. if you haven't watched ahead, shame on you. That's your fault. Yeah, I agree. Get with it. <laughs> Get with the program, everyone. And honestly, I don't think anyone would be listening to this podcast who wasn't familiar with the show anyway. So I don't think we're really spoiling much. All right. All right. So chapter three, the polywog. Yeah. What are your thoughts about this episode? The episode as a whole. Um, one of the things that is interesting is that season one had full stories every time and this uh -huh. one's the ones that it's kind of the episode itself and this isn't to detract from it because i think good shows need these kind of kind of episodes once in a while mm -hmm. but this show this episode is just to lead you into the next episode really it is it's kind of a not... bridging episode I, I think that's a good point in the first season you had more episodes that were self-contained right or at least told a, you get the sense that there was a complete story being told even though each episode was connected and continued what came before this uh, there are some episodes in this particular season that f i don't i wouldn't say that they're filler but they seem to work more as bridge episodes they they further the right. story along but they're not self-contained like in the first season no the first season was really good at doing that in fact like it had so many of those that i'm not sure it's possible to not you know binge watch that show because it, the cliffhanger at the end of each episode was yeah. just enough just enough to make you go oh my gosh and now i have to keep going whereas this one you know it has a couple episodes here and there that mm -hmm. are just there to lead you to the next part of the story yeah. and even though you know this one is one of them it is a, still a really really good episode so what happens in this episode oh what doesn't happen in this episode <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, uh, some of the things that I think are important in this episode are, one, is how interesting it is that following Eleven and Eleven's search for identity is so, I mean, kids are not listening to this, so goddamn interesting. <laughs> that is one of the thematic elements of this particular season is Eleven trying to establish her own identity or learn more about, you know, who she is and where does she come from? And I think that is an incredible thing because when you think about it, when we were that age and we're searching for identity and, you know, as I am now, I, I realized like adults who knew what was going on in their lives that we looked up to were so full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> so bullshit. I'm still searching for who I am. Right. You know I mean, you know, I don't know myself any better than when I was a teenager. I'm less confused, I suppose, uh, about the world itself. But mm -hmm. you know, we we're always still searching for who we are. Yeah. And I think this really rings well for the viewers who are of that age, the young people. Right. Uh, you know, I know a kid that loves the show, and. Search for identity is a big deal for young people. Yes, it is. Very important. And it doesn't change. I mean, I'm 38 year olds are searching for their identity. 50 year olds are searching for their identity. Mm -hmm. If you're inquisitive about who you are in the world around you and where you fit in, that's not going to change. And that is why I think one of the appeals of the show is it goes back to the idea of stranger things and right. being, feeling outcast and strange yeah so yeah one of the advances in this particular episode is it reveals quite a bit about 11 and hopper and how they came together so in the first episode of this season 11 only appeared at the very end and we found that she had been living with hopper 
all this time. The episode after that, we saw how Eleven survived and escaped the Upside Down, but now we're being shown, here's what happened after she escaped, here's how she hooked up with Hopper, and how they came to be living together. Right, right, with uh, the weird, strange box in the woods. That box where he kept, like, leaving food oh, and stuff? that's, yeah. It's such a weird kind of thing, and I guess it's sort of normalish from what I've read, that there are places that do that kind of thing, where it's like a first aid kit. Oh, interesting. Or and things like that, that, you know, they leave in the woods for people that are just, you know, out and they might get lost. But uh, I did not know that. Yeah. Because I thought that was weird at the end of the first season that, you know, he just drives out to the woods and leaves some food in this box in the woods. Yeah. Uh, and I think we sort of inferred that it was meant for Eleven because he was, you know, taking waffles out there. Right, right. But yeah, that seemed like such a strange detail. Yeah. Interestingly, a loving detail, too, because, you know, I, being one of those Joseph Campbell people and, you know, people that reads poetry and, you know, we met in Shakespeare class. Yeah. The, the whole idea of storytelling is fascinating. And the fact that he's leaving this out there for her, I think slightly alludes to the fact that he's leaving food in a coffin-shaped box for another young uh -huh. child. That's a, that's a good point. And that's one of the things that I think provides such an emotional connection between the two of them is that, you know, he did lose a daughter and he is gaining one in, in Eleven. So what is their relationship like, do you think? Well, uh, in this episode, as we're talking about it, mm -hmm. it's on extremely shaky grounds. Uh -huh. It's on extremely shaky grounds in that as well as they're going to communicate to each other, it's impossible for them to see that they're on, they're, they're, they're going down two different roads. A hundred percent. Even if she said, you know, here's what I'm feeling, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. He's not going to get it because he's, he's looking at protection and she's yes. looking at who am I and let me find Mike. So she has that these is... two things that are she, her two things that she's focused on so deeply are the antithesis of his thing. And there's no way for those goals. to meet in the middle. And one of the things that I think is frustrating for viewers, frustrating in a good way, because I think it helps to uh, propel the story, uh, the conflict between the two of them, is that conflict is rooted very much in lack of communication. Right. Part of it is Hopper it just isn't really fully communicating his feelings and his ideas to her, but also part of the problem is her communication skills are limited in a way because of her upbringing being so, so miserable. Right, right. And you know he he doesn't have great communication skills either. I think that yeah. alludes to the fact that it's good, it's good character making. You know what I mean? He was he's an '80s father. Mm -hmm. He's he was in the military, so they made him a little bit. I don't want to say thick, but I do kind of want to say thick. He's he's <laughs> he's thick in the way he should be. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Do as I say. Yeah. Just just follow my orders. Just follow my Everything orders. Be okay. Yeah, great character. A couple of things he did in season one really did annoy me, but it was also mm -hmm. it was very eighties. So yes, I kind of had to let it go. The idea that like. There were so many people that he punched in that first season. <laughs> and you're like, you would have lost your job. You would have <laughs> been on the news. So, yeah, that he, he lets his fists do the talking because you don't mess around with Jim, right? No, you don't. So, yeah, just jumping ahead a little bit to the music, you know, one of the sort of featured songs of this episode is Jim Croce, You Don't Mess Around with Jim. We see uh, his taste in music is kind of interesting in that he listens to Jim Croce, Pink Floyd, and Super, Super Tramp. Tramp. Yeah. But also the song You Don't Mess Around with Jim is kind of his theme song. Or we yeah. can see it uh, as being his theme song. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the tough guy, Jim, you don't mess around with him. Of course, if you listen to the, the story within that song, Jim ends up being killed. As Jim Shadowing, Shadowing, maybe. 
Jim, Jim in that song, Jim is not the best guy. No, he's not. No, I mean, really cool that, you know, when he opens up that box and he kind of shuffles through and you see those first few, the, the Pink Floyd is that digital <laughs> master's one. You know, those are pressed straight from the very first tapes. Uh-huh. So those are like super expensive. That that Pink Floyd is well into the, you know, four, five, six hundred dollar range now. Oh wow, I did not know that. But yeah. it kind of threw me off. I, I didn't expect Jim Hopper to be a fan of Pink Floyd. Yeah, I think part of that too is, you know, the, I you know, I don't want to read too much into it because you're not sure like how the writers go into this but uh -huh. you know dark side of the moon is literally about reality and not reality mm -hmm. so the album itself you know refers to you know, the upside down when you think about it oh that's a good point it's a psychological upside down there's the light side of the moon and the dark right. side of the moon exactly and you know in one way i see it as a representation of the upside down and then what we're calling the real world I think that's probably deliberate. I mean, I really wasn't looking at it that closely, but now that you mention it, yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be, or it could just be Glenn reading too much into something. I, I don't think so, because one of the things I think the writers do really well is that sense of intertextuality, where are these references that they make to other books or other works of art helps play into your understanding of this particular story that they're telling. Right. So knowledge of one text helps illuminate this other text that you're dealing with. So I think oh, that's absolutely. probably deliberate on their part. Yeah, it could be. So well, some other things uh, that happen in this particular episode, we see Dustin and his relationship with D'Artagnan, the, the polylog <laughs> itself. Yeah, yeah. There's so much to unpack with this part. It's fun. There's a whole subgenre of horror films in the 80s that this kind of yes. thing really uh, mirrors. There's also, it mirrors some serious horror genre stuff as well. You know, when, when it busts out of the uh, bathroom, the polywog, uh -huh. and we see, you know, the the cat in the beginning of the episode, there's a lot of alien there. Yes. And, uh, you know, the busting out of the bathroom is a lot like the busting out of poor John Hurt's chest. We're going to talk about aliens a little bit down the road. But, yeah, this is one of the ways that this particular season plays into aliens and the alien franchise. Because we know, as the audience, we know what Dart is. We know that it oh, yeah. is the slug that came over from the Upside Down with Will. It's a slug that he throws up at the end of season one. Right. And just to make us really aware of that, we get a quick visual flashback to that in this particular episode. So they really want us to know that's what's happening here. That's that's what's going on. Absolutely. So yeah, Dart is the equivalent of the chest burster from Alien. Yeah, and when you think of, uh, you know, it Will is in a sense John Hurt in that yes. in that small you know kind of picture. Although Will comes out much better than John Hurt. <laughs> well, yeah, I was. <laughs> He's alive. <laughs> he is saying. alive. Really better though. Yeah, that, that's debatable. Oh we'll see as it goes on. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, I mean, it, technically, I mean, John Hurt didn't get possessed, but no, no, no. Let's see. Uh, there's a lot of. Elle's hair at this point is a lot like Ripley's. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good point. You know, when Ripley's is grown out and it's kind of curly, it's kind of like mm -hmm. that. When her hair was shaved, it was kind of like the military Ripley. And so you have a lot of the Ripley stuff. And then, of course, Dustin's cat is the same yeah. shade as, and I can't remember his name right now, but I always even used to remember the cat's name from Alien, and now I can't remember it. Jonesy. Jonesy. Yep. Yeah, here it's Muse, but yeah, Jonesy in Alien. So yeah, and that's a good point. You know, Muse's reaction to Dart is essentially the same as Jonesy's reaction to the alien. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's another clue there. Yeah, and then, you know, D'Artagnan also 
represents this whole like you know back then there were these subgenre of horror films things like ghoulies and critters and of course gremlins they're tiny kind of mirrors that stuff yes gremlins in particular we get so many gremlins references or allusions in this particular episode so yeah dart is very much meant to or we're meant to equate dart with the gremlins the the evil gremlins you know the way that dart is with dustin kind of gives you a little bit of a gizmo feel mm -hmm. and we know that that's not gonna last at some point he's going to be stripe so exactly and, and just for our listeners who aren't familiar if you haven't seen gremlins first of all watch gremlins because not only is it just a classic movie in its own right it's a really good movie it's a classic for a reason but the idea of gremlins is you have these little creatures that are cute and furry but then if you don't obey the rules of you know how to care for them properly they become vicious sort of reptilian creatures that go on the attack right and so yeah we get so many connections to gremlins here so yeah dart is essentially an evil gremlin he's stripe who is the main evil gremlin in the movie right we see that in his coloration for one thing you know his skin is that sort of mottled green and yellow which is very much oh. the same color as the evil gremlins are when they're right when they metamorphose into their lizard form we do get that idea of metamorphosis happening in this particular episode because he suddenly grows legs right yep and he has uh an identifying mark on his hindquarters that essentially acts as the stripe on stripe from gremlins okay. because that's what separates stripe from the rest of the gremlins makes him identifiable is he has this identifying mark of this stripe of hair right his mohawk as it yes were. exactly he's a punk rock gremlin and if you don't think that this is deliberate on the showrunner's part here when dart escapes from the av room the music that plays is almost identical to the Gremlins theme. You only oh, yeah. hear it for just a moment, but if you pay close attention to the music, it is very similar to the Gremlins theme. Oh, wow. How cool is that? I did not yes. notice. That's neat. Go back and, and watch that scene and listen to the music, and it's like, oh, shit, it is Gremlins. Gotcha. Other Gremlins connections? There's, I think, a really obvious one in this episode. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, um, sunlight, sort of. There's not just the sunlight. About, like, he doesn't like the heat. There is that. Yeah. So because, that's a gremlins well, thing, right? Yeah. Because remember, gremlins. There are three rules to care for your gremlin. One of which is, you know, don't expose them to bright light, especially sunlight. Right. What are and the then, other rules of gremlins? Well, one of them actually does show up too because Dustin literally says the words, now that you're saying this, it's all clicking in my head. Yeah. Dustin says the words that he doesn't need water, but in gremlins, you can't get them wet. And when you think about the, the rules of gremlins, they really don't make sense. <laughs> but yeah, one of the rules of gremlins is you, you don't get them wet because that causes them to multiply. Right. Which, I mean... Okay, on planet Earth, it's like 70% water. That doesn't make sense, but okay, let's go with it. <laughs> right, right, right. And then the uh, the third gremlins rule, which now I'm seeing that that is actually taken care of too, is don't feed them after midnight. And then Never, this, ever feed them after midnight. And in this, we see the whole nougat thing happening yes. over and over again. And it's kind of adorable that uh -huh. uh, he's eating three musketeers a lot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, uh, feeds him, and it causes Dart to grow and metamorphosis. Because that's what happens in Gremlins, is you, if you feed them after midnight, which, again, doesn't make sense because it's always after midnight somewhere. You know, what about time zones? How does that play? <laughs> right. If you feed them after midnight, that's what, that's what causes them to metamorphose from their cute, furry form into their nasty, reptilian form. Right, right. We also get three rules in this episode did you catch those 
Hopper calls them the don't be stupid rules. Oh. So one of them is to always keep the curtains closed. Yes. Yeah, these are the rules that he establishes for Eleven. So that's kind of the gremlins rule of like, don't get the, don't get sunlight on them. Rule um, number one, always keep the curtains drawn. Rule number two. Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. Rule number two, only open the door if you hear my secret knock. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And then rule three, never ever go outside alone, especially not in daylight. Gotcha. Yeah. So Gremlins is all over this particular episode. Right, right. Yeah, no, fascinating. I didn't notice most of this. You know, you at times you notice like the whole idea. You're like, oh yeah, this feels a little bit like Gremlins, but uh -huh. you didn't really think of it that way. Neat. And then we have, I, I think something interesting happening with Dustin here and his relationship with the others. Now, Dustin has, has always been one of my favorite characters. And in the first season, he has that scene where he's talking to uh, Mr. Clark about curiosity doors. You know, why are you keeping this curiosity door closed? Right. And that's echoed in this particular episode when he goes to the library and he says he's on a curiosity voyage and he needs his paddles. The paddles super being cute. the books that he wants to check out. Yeah. Super cute what? librarian, too. That is true. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm with you on that. But what does he wow. do in the library? Uh, he grabs a bunch of books, mostly on reptiles and amphibians, mm -hmm. and he has already had five checked out. Yeah, she's telling him again with the rules. Yeah, yes. there, there are these rules, mm -hmm. and uh, the best part is that he uses the old trick in the book, like, "Hey, what's that behind you?" and literally <laughs> just runs out. Runs. He steals the books and runs out. Those are federally owned books, young man. You're going to go to jail. <laughs> so here's the thing. It's all cute. It's funny. But yep. at the same time, he's a little bit of a mad scientist. <laughs> he is. He is. He's breaking the rules for knowledge. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, he, he steals the books. He uh, sort of cons Mr. Clark into helping him put together a sensory deprivation tank which is exactly what dr brenner did he's the one who built the sensory deprivative deprivation tank in the first season oh yeah dustin is kind of you know if he's not careful he could become a dr brenner he's a budding dr brenner because think about how obsessed he is with dart and protecting dart and making sure he gets credit for his discovery oh yeah 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 he doesn't want Mr. Clark to have any of the credit for yes. this. He brings it up over and over again in one of the you know most humorous scenes in the whole show. <laughs> yeah, I just love how he he just sticks to his guns. It's like, oh, this is mine. Remember that this is mine. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it's played for laughs and it is very humorous and very cute. But at the same time, there's a certain sinisterness behind what he's doing. And um... it's like, oh, okay. I guess. I mean, I I don't think he sees anything wrong with Dart at the moment, though. You know what I mean? Right. He doesn't see the potential. Mike, I think, might even be a little bit too much on the other side of that. Yeah, Mike is one of my least favorite characters. I mean, that he's an absolute brat. Yeah, and in this yeah. episode, when it comes to D'Artagnan, he's like, kill it, kill it, kill it. Uh -huh. And he comes up with this logic of like, you know. It's from the upside down, so it must be evil. It must be evil. There's no there's no good people in the Death Star. And my brain's like, are you kidding me? The Death Star has union people that have to work there, probably. <laughs> you know? I mean there, there's that the Death Star is evil, man. There, you know, the the lady at the cafeteria that's like giving everybody their mashed potatoes and gravy. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stormtroopers to feed. She's right. not evil, she's just making celery sticks for you guys. Exactly. There's that classic scene in Clark's where they talk about, you know, the construction workers who built the Death Star. Do they deserve to get blown up like that? They were right. just doing their jobs, man. They're just doing they their weren't jobs, political. They're, yeah, they're not. It's not like everybody on there is a Nazi. There right. are regular people there. Yeah. You know, you got janitors and shit. Yeah, you do. You absolutely do. <laughs> But there is, I think, a blindness on Dustin's part that is similar to the kind of blindness that you see in Dr. Brenner or the scientists who are putting 
their work and gaining the knowledge ahead of consequences. Right. Kind of like yeah. um yeah, reanimator or Dr. Frankenstein. Yes. You know, the, the discovery is more important than we'll figure out the moral and ethics afterwards. And you're like, maybe you should start thinking about that before you start going down that road. <laughs> exactly. And Max does say maybe some scientist brought it here and it escaped, which is more true than she knows. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> uh, and then we get the story of Mr. Baldo. What's that about? You know, I, it's an interesting thing. It's kind of like, you know, he's... One, the, the story's there to make Will feel better. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about him telling it is that, you know, for the boyfriend of Joyce... Yeah, Bob. And, and Oris, right. I, yeah, I'm not really, I'm referring to him not as Bob for a reason, actually. Okay. This is the boyfriend okay. or a potential stepdad. It is hard to connect with a brand new kid. So okay. I, think the, I think, you know, the story is him trying to connect really, really hard with him. It is absolutely well-intentioned. It's very well-intentioned. It's a bizarre story. And uh -huh. I don't think Will's ready for it, to be honest with you, in my opinion, <laughs> as an outside viewer and not not inside the show itself. Uh -huh. I'm thinking, don't tell him this story, man. I, I think that's true. One. I think, you know, as a viewer, you know, seeing that happen, we know that's probably not good advice. <laughs> right. But, but right. you know, it, it's it's well meant and he's trying to be helpful. He is. So he tells the story of basically an evil clown uh -huh. trying to get him to come with him for the gift of a balloon, which is clearly an it, uh, a reference to Stephen King's it. And the Duffer brothers are huge fans of King, as you know, every episode we go through, I'm sure there's a King reference somewhere in every single episode. I'm sure. And just as a, a little bit of an aside, before the Duffer Brothers made Stranger Things, reportedly they wanted to adapt it into a movie, but they really? weren't well known enough to be able to do it, so they went with Stranger Things instead. And then, of course, the recent film version of it does star Finn Wolfhard, who plays Mike here as one of the characters in that. And the, that film version is very much inspired by Stranger Things. So there is that cross-pollination happening there. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the symbols and motifs in this episode. We get the story of Phineas Gage and the American Crowbar case. What do you know about that? Very interesting thing. A steel rod goes through Phineas's head, and Phineas is never the same again. And one of the things that should be pointed out is that where the bar goes through Phineas's head is the same area that produces, especially in males, mm -hmm. their personality is not really technically developed until their late 20s. So in the frontal lobe, that yeah. is still developing. And the reason why I say males is that I think, I think the science for like females is like their personality they're more mature. So basically they beat us in personality, no matter what. <laughs> and I, I think like the idea is that, you know, they're developing their personality up to, you know, 20 year olds, you know, mm -hmm. when they're 20, 21, whereas it takes us a little bit longer. And I, that, you know, the story with Phineas is that, you know, he's not the same because of this bar goes through his head and it, it, it goes through the frontal lobe where his mm -hmm. personality is. And he loses who he is. So the rest of the village doesn't really, or the town, I say village like it's a really right. old story, but it's not that old of a story. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, 1840s, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He loses who he is. Yeah, or at least he, he experiences what's reported to be uh, drastic changes in personality. So yeah, Phineas Gage, he was working as a railroad foreman. His job was to pack explosives into into the landscape to blast it out in order to clear it for the railroad okay and okay. he would you know basically dig a hole or, or shaft 
pack it with explosives and gunpowder, and then he would tamp it down with dirt and sand in order to make it to, to direct the blast toward into the ground as opposed to out into the open. And right. he had this essentially it was a ramrod, a tamping rod that he had custom made that he would use to do that. But supposedly he got distracted while he was tamping down the sand and the dirt and it caused a spark, which caused the explosion to happen, which sent the rod through his skull, scrambled his brains a little bit and like shot like 80 feet away. Yeah. And it's remarkable that not only did it not kill him, it he didn't seem to have much of reaction to it in terms of, of being hurt by it. Yeah, yeah. No, strangely enough, you know, he got distracted because this uh, kid offered him a bunch of nougat. And of course, <laughs> he had to like, turn and be like, that's What's what it nougat? was. That's what it was, yeah. You know, it's a neat little candy bar, pre, uh, you know, pre Three Musketeers and blew his, blew, blew the rod through his head. Yeah. And and it's debatable just how drastically his his personality changed but it is documented that yeah he did have a, a an experience a change in personality because of this which led to so many advances in neuroscience and psychology but the, the idea is that it's symbolic of what's happening in stranger things because of what happens with with will you know he gets possessed essentially by what we will come to know as the mind flayer and experiences a great change in his personality as well. Right, right. So it's kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen with Will at the end of this episode. Some of the illusions in this episode, uh, we've talked about gremlins. E.T. Yeah. is also referenced. Did you catch those? I mean, I saw the E.T. doll in the background of mm -hmm. that one scene. Um, yeah. The show itself, I mean, again, you have the candy, you know, with the Three Musketeers, and E.T. Yeah. E. loved him the Reese's Pieces. And, and this is, this episode does begin, it's still Halloween night, so Dustin is coming back from trick-or-treating. Also, and this is something which I didn't notice until I was re-watching the episode this time, Dustin's mom is dressed as a cat. And that's how D. Wallace's character dresses for Halloween in E.T. Shut up. Wow. <laughs> okay. That's cool. I, <laughs> I did, did not, not notice that. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did not catch that until watching it, rewatching it this time around. So, yeah. Hell, well, yeah. That's nice. That's a cool little detail. Another little nod to E.T. there. You know, uh, I've get... only seen E.T. once in my whole life. So, that, that really? would be hard for me to remember. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense because. You know, as, as I explained before, I fucking hate E.T. And so I saw it <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was, oh God, seven years old. Right. And it gave me nightmares for years. So I didn't watch E.T. again until I was preparing for this class or the, the class that this podcast is based on. Okay. So just a few years ago. So, yeah, if I hadn't seen E.T. relatively recently, I wouldn't have caught that. Yeah, yeah. Remembering what the mom was dressed as, there's no way that, you know, <laughs> 1979 Glenn's going to remember that. <laughs> right. Uh, we get a reference to Yertle the Turtle. That one's fairly obvious. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the great Dr. Seuss book. Yep. Yertle the Turtle. Also, it's a it's a very terrible uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers song. <laughs> I did not know that. Yep. I, I just familiar with uh, the Dr. Seuss. No, it was in one. Of, it was off one of their first albums. You know, pre being big. Okay. Like one of the you know the ones before Mother's Milk that okay. you know, people don't know very well. But yeah, no, they they did a song and yeah, it was hilarious that Yertle got kicked out of his home for, you know, and now this monster. And I thought yes. about that for a moment, and I you know I read one thing online about it where these two guys are arguing about how upset they were that Yertle got kicked out of his home for a monster. And I thought, do they not realize that he's got his, he's wearing his home? Technically, Yertle's <laughs> home is a mobile home, right? His shell is his home. Uh, Gremlins, as we said, Ghostbusters, a uh, fairly obvious reference because, you know, the, the boys dress up as Ghostbusters for Halloween. I right. thought it's interesting that Dustin is dressed as Ray from Ghostbusters. 
which kind of makes sense because Dustin is uh, and Ray and Ghostbusters are really similar kind of characters. They're both, you know, scientifically minded and also very enthusiastic about uh, about science and about the things that they experience. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, Dustin is Ray. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, we get another centipede reference, reference to the game centipede. Yeah, we, I'm, no, I'm not sure where that was. That is, it's in the same shot where you see the ET doll. There is a centipede poster or sign on the oh. wall, which is very easy to overlook. But it's the same poster that we got in the first episode of this season in the arcade. So okay, another cool. callback to Centipede, which also I think is thematically relevant because, you know, Centipede, the game is all about, you know, killing this monstrous Centipede that's attacking you. Well, that's kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen with, you know, the, the Polywog. Right. Here's one I'm not sure about. Masters of the Universe. So there is an action figure, a toy on Dustin's shelf, which looks like a Masters of the Universe figure, although I'm not positive because I couldn't identify it. At first, I thought it was Beast Man, but when I looked at the Beast Man that was available back in that day, it doesn't match up. So I'm not sure about what's going on there. Now, we did get references or, or we did see Masters of the Universe figures in the first season because Lucas has the Man at Arms figure, which makes right. sense because Man at Arms was the armorer within the the mythology of Masters of the Universe, and that's the role that Lucas plays within Stranger Things. He's the armorer. He's the guy who brings the weapons, right? Right. And if that is like a Beastman figure in this episode... It kind of makes sense, and that you know Dustin would be the the master of beasts here. Oh yeah, yeah. So that one I'm not sure about, but I there, there's something there. Pink Floyd and Super Tramp, as we talked about earlier, we got those references. Jim Croce, Anne of Green Gables comes back. We got a previous reference to Anne of Green Gables because that was the book that Hopper read to his daughter. Did you catch it in this episode? Was it what he was reading to Elle? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so he's reading... The, the book that he read to his daughter, he is reading to Elle here. And in this case, they're reading a passage in which uh, Anne is reflecting on the death of her mother and how he never, she never really knew her mother, and that causes Elle to think about her own mother okay. that she didn't know. Do you know the uh, book well? Mm -hmm. I don't. In fact, I've never read it. I've just okay. read synopses of it online. Radio Shack, as we mentioned, we got a reference to that. I got a reference to the Death Star. Yeah. Got a Blondie reference. Did you catch that? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a cool uh, poster in... Um, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember her name now. Nancy. Nancy's room. And it's of uh, my favorite Blondie album, uh, Auto America. I did not catch that before. I only caught it on this particular watch through. I'm like, oh shit, there is a Blondie poster there in Nancy's bedroom. Yeah. So that was, um, if you're remembering your Blondie songs, the big hit off that one was Tide is High. Okay. I'm not a huge Blondie fan. I, I do know their big hit songs. And so I'm not sure which albums they were from. But yeah, okay. I do know that song. That was the big hit off of that one. Awesome. Um, yeah, cool album, cool poster. I'm going to call bullshit on this one. There is a poster that says, say no to crack in the school when I think it's Dustin uh, passes by Mr. Clark in the hallway. He also passes a poster that says, say no to crack. And like I said, I'm going to call bullshit on this one because we'll talk about the war on drugs later on, but crack really didn't become a popular thing until a few years after this is said. So it's anachronistic for 1984. Sure, sure. I mean, there's a... So, yeah, there was a whole war on drugs thing and just say no to drugs, that sort of stuff going on at this time. But crack in particular, that didn't become a problem until a few years later. So, yeah, bullshit on that one. I definitely agree. I think, like, the only posters you would have seen like that were probably in New York at that time. I don't think the Midwest yeah. even knew what crack would have been. Definitely not Hawkins, Indiana. No. Right. 
one of the things that's great about Stranger Things is just like watching the background at times, you know, and you're catching yes. the posters or the toys and all that kind of stuff. The in the bathroom, look, if anybody's been in a boy's bathroom, there's not <laughs> there's not a pumpkin drawn on a stall. Right. There's usually phone numbers of someone's mom uh -huh. or, or wieners. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, some like filthy limerick or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A pumpkin? Bizarre. <laughs> you know, as a TV show or even a movie or whatever, everything that you see on screen is there for a reason because set designers put it there for a reason. You know, those right. they're making deliberate choices about these things. So, yeah, when you look at what's going on in the background, it's there for a reason. And one of the things I think is really cool about this show is not only is it there for a reason, it helps to inform the characters or the show in some way. It helps, it gives you some insight into the story. Yeah. So I, it's such a rich visual text. Dr. Pepper? <laughs> no, I, we, we had Dr. Pepper in this episode along with- Dr. Pepper Three and Tab. And, and Tab. Yeah. And Three Musketeers, yeah. Yeah. So- Man, that is the 80s right there. That's what uh, all of us kids had in the 80s. Music-wise, now, I, I need you to, to check my work here. Because <laughs> there are three songs used in this episode that I could not identify. And when I went online to look up for song lists, they list four songs, which I did not hear. And from what I can tell, none of those songs are the three songs that I could identify. Now, there are three songs that I could identify, which are Mercy Brothers' Whistle on the River. Right. That's what's playing on Bob's tape deck when he's driving Will to, to school. You don't mess around with Jim, of course. That's what we hear when in the montage or Hopper and Eleven are cleaning up the cabin. And then Tones on Tail Go works as a transition when Eleven leaves the cabin and we go into the, the basketball game between steve and billy right right what a great song to use at that point too you yes know, for both of those scenes really well yes uh, tones on tail is a really cool uh offshoot from bauhaus yeah i'm um, not that very familiar with tones on tail but i was able to catch that and that yeah. i think that's a really good song no it's a great song really well used Th that's the thing with the show too is the what they pick at times works so well um yes you know one of the most heart-wrenching scenes and we'll go back to a different episode is you know peter gabriel's version of heroes yeah oh god which you know, it's it's a, in that scene it is and it's used twice in the show once in the first season and then once in the third season as well oh, okay and I, you know, at first it seems like it's an odd choice because it is it is anachronistic. That was recorded in 2010. But, of course, the song Heroes, you know, has been around for a, a much longer than that. Right. But, yeah, it works so well thematically with those particular scenes. Yeah. No, they do a really good job with that. Yeah. You know, uh, I think I found Psychedelic Furs Ghost in You, but it's mm -hmm. played literally in the background where you, you wouldn't hear it there's too much else going on okay and i'm not sure about the others at all like i didn't really try too hard to look for them especially okay. jump streets uh how i feel about you right so according to the list that i checked online those four songs are psychedelic furs the ghost in you jump street how i feel about you ill repute clean cut american kid and the al casey combo cooking yeah, I, my guess is that Al Casey is going to sound like, you know, background music to us because it's probably just a little jazzy thing. Yeah. And there are three songs, like I said, that I couldn't identify. There is a point where Jonathan and Nancy are having lunch outside. They're sitting on the hood of his car. And then another student puts on his earphones, which gives her the idea to go get a tape recorder. Um, yep, yep. And there's a, a little music that you hear over the headphones. Okay. Which I couldn't identify what that song is. There's a song when Billy drives away from the school because he gets pissed at Max for not showing up to drive her home. And there's a guitar riff that plays as he's driving away. 
could not identify what that was. It feels really generic to me. Okay. And then there is a song that's playing when Karen Wheeler is in the kitchen when Jonathan and Nancy come home. Huh. And I couldn't identify that. I thought that might be the Al Casey combo one, but when I listened to it online, it doesn't match up with what, what I heard in the episode. Okay. And here's the thing. I'm watching these episodes on Blu-ray, so I'm not streaming them on Netflix. And I know sometimes shows, when they're released on disc, they don't have the license to use the same songs that are used in the streaming version. So I wonder if that's the problem I'm having here is because I'm watching it on disc, I'm getting generic music instead of the licensed music that's on the, the streaming version. Gotcha, because I am also watching them from disc. Okay. So <laughs> I cannot uh, cannot help you, <laughs> Vince. Okay. So you're in the, the same boat as I am. Absolutely same boat. Yeah. So I know that did happen when you look at the, uh, the trailer for season two, when it was originally released and on Netflix, it uses Thriller as the music. Oh, but wow. when the trailer was released on disc, they... Either they couldn't get the rights to use Thriller for home distribution, or they just didn't want to pay for it, which I think is probably what the case was. They used generic music instead. Oh, wow. So okay. I, I, I suspect that's probably what happened here. No, it probably is. I, you know, not to get off on a tangent, but uh, one of the things people really dislike about um, getting the discs for The Muppet Show is that they can't get the music for most of those episodes. So there's just a huge chunks of like, like, I think the Vincent Price episode would normally, you know, it'd be like 20, let's say it's 24 minutes. Uh-huh. I think it's like, I think that episode alone is like 14 minutes because they couldn't get the license to like two wow. songs. So they had to like just take those scenes out. Oh, that sucks. And, and I know that's happened with other like TV shows when they get released on DVD. Sometimes it takes years for shows to be released because they just can't get the legal rights to use the music. That right. was in the original episode. And I think that sucks because, especially in the case of like Stranger Things, where the music is so thematically relevant to the show, you know, it's there for a reason. It helps to inform the story. And, you know, when you you have to end up changing it that way, you're changing the narrative, even if in just a, a slight way. Yeah, definitely. You know, it keeps the art the way it's it was intended to be shown. Exactly, exactly. Don't put a big, giant, fluffy mustache on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> so you see the Mona Lisa. Well, I know, in that that's case. a bad example because I kind of want to see the big, fluffy mustache now. <laughs> exactly. I said those words. Exactly. Now, Damn it, that's Glenn. all I can see. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, anything else you want to add before we sign off for this episode? It's it's a fun episode, like I said, but you know it's also it's not a self contained one, but um, weirdly, still works really well, and you feel like you know you get your money's worth out of this episode. The polywog, the title itself, of course, the obvious is the demogorgon, and, and that's the thing is, but isn't isn't L also a polywog at this point? Well, she's looking to for who she is, number one, so she's uh-huh. still kind of growing. And we're, okay. she's still also, she's not at her full, her full powers, right? She's, she's still developing into something. That is true. That is true. So you so, have yeah. this polywog that, you know, in a sense, maybe all the kids are polywogs. Yeah, sort of tadpoles growing up. Yeah. Developing. Yeah, that could be. And that, you, you do make a good point in that episode titles usually have multiple meanings. So yeah. I didn't even think about polywog and what the polywog means in this particular context, but that's a good point. Yeah, I mean the Ooh. demogorgon's the obvious answer to right. that. I think right. There's there's a bigger idea of it, you know. And again, you know, the idea of the story itself that uh, it's not self-contained. That in itself uh, makes it a polywog. That is true. That's not, a good it's point. Not fully developed. That's a good point. I like that. That is something to think about. Yeah, what is the polywog of this episode? That's a good question. Damn, I wish I thought of that. Yeah. 
Uh, that's okay. why you hire me, Vince. That's why you exactly. Pay big bucks. Exactly. So the next episode, the homework is to look into the history of the Apple Macintosh, and we're going to talk about the episode "Will the Wise." So until then, do you have anything that you want to promote or plug? Not at the moment, no. So again, thanks for joining me, Glenn. Thanks for listening to us, listeners. And until next time, take it easy, take care, and as always, stay strange. Stranger Things in the 1980s is produced by Dread Pirate Productions. Cover art is by Sherry Archer. The theme music is Cobalt by Alex Bloxham, used under license from Filmstrobe. Send questions or topic suggestions to Dread Pirate Productions at gmail.com. <laughs>